<laughs> yeah. Um, that was built in 1963. I heard that they, at that time, I, I don't know since, uh, there had only been one accident and everybody walked away from the plane. So uh, even though it's precarious, uh, they haven't really had that uh, many problems. Because of uh, the air service and the ferry service, uh, tourist population grew down there. It's become quite a popular place for uh, diving. You know, every island down there says they've got the best diving waters in uh, the entire uh, world. Um, I, I'm not a diver, didn't do any diving down there, but uh, as it says here, the pictures and videos uh, are really, really beautiful. But first, you got to get to St. Martin in order to catch the uh, small plane to save up. That was the beach. Hi. <laughs> what was that danger someone said? Uh, to to uh, be careful of the wake, you know, the jet engines. Uh, if you get hit by that, it's not going over for sure. You got to watch the tape. Where is my? There it is. So just click on this. That should be. Yeah. yeah. Just another view, uh, another aircraft. Fine. A little better perspective on how close it gets to the beach. Remember going to an air show in Chicago when I was living there, and uh, I had a, a sailboat. And damn, B2 bomb of the I thought he was going to hit my phone. He asked of my phone. It's like the sailboat. Here. Well, no. How high do you think he is, Martin? 15 feet, maybe 20. <laughs> Unless From the, the, the bottom of the other car, certainly. Yeah. I mean, you've got to be good to do that, really. Okay, here's the airstrip on Sabre. It's uh, about 1,300 feet long, a little shorter than an aircraft carrier, and uh, there's not a lot of room for error. It's uh, only special planes, uh, the uh, short takeoff and landing planes can, uh, can uh, use the strip. Um, the planes, I think, um, a seat to 19 passengers. Uh, pilots are mostly former Dutch Air, um, uh, uh, Air Force uh, pilots, specially trained with these planes. Trivia, a fully extended windsock is 15 miles an hour. Okay. They do that because at 15, it's uh, they close it off for uh, student pilots. Uh, if it's too windy or if it's too wet, they will not land here. You imagine if you get a crosswind coming into this, I mean, oh.
So you took the plane instead of the ferry? Yeah. I was in a hurry. <laughs> Look how close it is. Look at that. <laughs> and it sits down and stops, you know, it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. It would be good to do that. Mm -hmm. There's some videos online on uh, YouTube that uh, show what, what's going on in the uh, the cockpit. What was the in-flight yeah. movie? Sorry? What was the in-flight movie? <laughs> <laughs> some of the like 12 minutes long. <laughs> oh, here, here's the control tower. Did you see that? There's the weather station. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, a roll of uh, you know paper towels. Need that communications. Hey, what else do you need? Yeah. I would have liked to put my uh, antenna at the top of that mountain. That would be good. Is there actually a road that goes up there, Roger? I mean, yeah, see on the left, yeah. the airstrip, and then the road is uh, is uh, going on. Oh, the, 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 so uh, there's cars there? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Here again, look at how blurry it positions inside if we do that. Yeah, <laughs> 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 It looks like a Brazilian plane that anywhere else. That's plain sight. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, there's a the story that I heard down there was um, an American flying his uh, own plane, um, tried to to land and. Uh, they raised out him and said, you're not allowed. You have to have special permission. And the guy says, eh, I've been flying for years. And when I landed, they uh, confiscated the plane and made him pay for taking it off. And I don't think they put him in jail. They got rid of him. <laughs> oh. All right. It's too loud. Okay. I was going to. This is another view. A little shorter clip. So. Anybody ever uh, work in the uh, Caribbean islands on uh, HF? The prefix is PJ. I don't know if you noticed on the plane, the prefix is PJ. Yeah. Is that PJ for the Dutch? That's the uh, country code and the radio prefix. Just like N you see on the airplanes. For the Dutch islands or for? Uh, Peach, the J is for the islands, I believe. I think that's right.
That'll be good. Some, some good time. I'm all very happy that they were serving drinks on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the one you came in on? Pardon me? You came in on this one? Yeah. No, uh, same type of plane. Yeah. Roger, do those propellers reverse? Is that how they get the short takeoff mm -hmm. and landing? Mm -hmm. they, they reverse the pitch. Okay. They don't actually reverse, it twists the prop. The pitch. So the, the pitch. So that basically you've got it's pushing air forward rather than pushing it backward. Actually, had a an antenna rotator that was a prop pitch rotator from an airplane. It was very small, but it was really heavy duty. So, did they all go to St. Martin's from from that airplane? Yeah, yeah, it's only St. Martin. Yeah. Actually, there's a um, there's a Polish guy. The last two weeks, maybe a little longer. That's down there right now uh, on a de expedition. Uh, I think I think I worked him. Yes, I did. I, I did work him. He's on the sister island, and I'm not sure of the pronunciation. Saint Eutychus or something like that. So you can see the islands back and forth very close. I think that's where he is. There's the road, the main road, cleverly known as the road, and. Uh, you can see how narrow it is and winding it is. It's uh, precarious, to say the least. Uh, speed limit, uh, 10, uh, 12 miles an hour in town, 25 outside. Uh, it took 20 years to build the thing. Can, imagine getting materials in there just to build it. You know, that sounds like Houston Roads, taking that long to build. Here is the road. Can you see the cursor? And this is a, uh, as it says here, a popular tourist activity called the ladders. 800 steps are carved into the side of the mountain. It goes up, to, you know, the, the Dutch have such a funny sense of humor. Uh, it goes up to uh, the middle of the island in terms of altitude. Uh, and the name of the uh, place is called the bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the heights in Houston. The heights in Houston is flat as a bed. They really thought of it. Uh, there's the, uh, the the ladder, the stairs going from the water, and uh, everything was brought in and up to uh, the, the, the middle of the island on these uh, steps, including uh, a small home uh, organ. Can you imagine? <laughs> I actually walked up it, but that was 40 years ago. You know, I, I don't think I'd make it to today. <laughs> okay. Um, it says that here that at the time of the trip, there was only one ham on uh, Seba. And uh, so, you know, thinking about saying it up and getting on the air, uh, on the air was really an exciting idea. Um, I booked a, a flight, uh, a charter flight on some something called something international uh, airlines, a fly by night airline from Chicago to St. Martin, and then the little flight over from St. Martin to Seba. Uh, the rig I took was a TSA-20. I've been using it uh, on the 21st floor of the high-rise I lived in. I worked 85 countries with a mobile whip antenna outside the, the uh, window, mm -hmm. including uh, all over the, the south. And I was on the north side of the building, so the signal had to go through the building. But one theory was the signal was actually bouncing off the building that was next door, and then going south. In any case, uh, it was uh, a good radio. I really liked it. Later, I, for this trip, I got uh, uh, an antenna uh, company so uh, operating. It was called KLM. It was a vertical <laughs> 10 through 40, a uh, bunch of accessories. Um, I just pass that around. Um, I had the original card for the radio, and then I built a crate uh, for the antenna and the accessories. Uh, the, uh, 
the antenna knocked down to about seven feet long or so. I uh, applied for a license, got uh, got the license, uh, no problem. It's coming around. Did you have to apply to, to Dutch to to the Dutch to get the license? No, uh, I wrote. Geez, I think I probably wrote to St. Martin. I think they probably are the center of all the government activities for that area. Uh, Search for a guest house. It was called Captain something or other at that time, not called uh, the Queen's Hotel. Uh, sent a letter, asked for permission, and made a reservation, of course, and uh, told them uh, I wanted to set up a station. They said, okay, uh, because I told them I'm going to give you a lot of publicity. And they said that was a good idea. No problem. Everything was falling in place. Okay, we're set. Day of departure, O'Hare Airport in Chicago. Plenty of time uh, to check in. And uh, the uh, woman behind the counter says, excuse me, sir, what's in that cart? And I said, oh, that's my radio. She said, oh, it's too large to fit into the seat. I said, no, I measured it. It's okay. She said, no, uh, it's too big, but we've got a special compartment where, you put the, where, where we will put the radio. Mm, big problem. I didn't like that idea. Okay, the flight was delayed five hours. No explanation. They never said, you know, we're going to go or not or whatever. Uh, also kind of a big problem. So the routing that came Chicago, Miami to St. Martin. Next big problem. The airport would be closed in St. Martin by the time we got down there because we were so late leaving Chicago. So we had to divert to a satellite for the recall. And say we're done. So uh, we deployed in San Juan, uh, 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 went to baggage claim, the antenna crate came out, I waited and waited and waited, no radio. Big problem, <laughs> really, really big problem. It had been stolen off the plane in Miami, or, or more likely San Juan, because it, being in the original cart and it had all those markings, uh, Kenwood and Model number and everything, and uh, uh, illegal radios are very popular in Latin America, and that's where it ended up, I'm sure. So I uh, finally got to the guest house and started uh, trying to find the radio. I was sending uh, telexes and faxes and making phone calls to fly by United International Airlines. They knew nothing, nothing. They could have cared less. So I spent a week with 5,000 goats. <laughs> uh, Really, the island is, is beautiful. And uh, for a week's vacation, a couple of weeks, uh, it's so peaceful, so quiet. People are friendly. Lots of Americans, Brits, by the way, too, and uh, people Dutch, a lot of Dutch, of course, and uh, so singing. Was English familiar? Yes. A lot of people no problem with language whatsoever. Uh, so the homeowners uh, insurance policy covered the cost of the, replacing the radio. I upgraded. Uh, the antenna sat in the original crate for years. When I got back to Chicago, I put it in the storage department of the building. Uh, I finally got back uh, on air in uh, Houston when I uh, got up here uh, in the uh, early 1990s and uh, finally uh, got it out of the crate. And I am, I'm using it today. It's a good antenna. So very, very, very disappointing. Question about the license. Yeah. Do you, uh... Did you use your call sign? My call sign, stroke it, PJ1, uh, two, PJ2, okay, whatever. Um, you know, hugely disappointing, um, but a truly unique experience. Any questions? How many countries did you work? <laughs> I didn't have a handheld. I didn't even work one country. I'm all QSO. So this is the D expedition that never was. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, thank you very much. What's what's the local food? What's the best meal you have outside? I don't really remember, but I bet it was fish. Actually, uh, the uh, the guest. <laughs> Uh, house that I stayed at was really nice, beautiful accommodations, uh, and the food was excellent. They had a, a nice patio out and back overlooking the pool, and it's very cool. Okay, well, if you uh, want to go to someplace exotic, I recommend Southern. Be, be sure you have your hands on your radio, radio the whole trip. 
tell her the woman behind the counter she doesn't know what she's talking about. And you, I, I should have thought. I could have put it in my lab. No, <laughs> old anchor at probably 40 pounds. I don't think so. <laughs> Silly. Okay. So, Thanks. We, I'm just hoping to God that we've got a... We're going to get some Wi-Fi here. Hold on. <clears throat> Perhaps not. Give me one second. I've just... Uh, I've got a couple of... We were talking on the... Uh, on the net about propagation, right? And it's, I don't know about you guys, but I find it very interesting what's been happening with, with solar, and solar in the, the last, shall we say, I don't know, couple of months. First of all, we go back to, uh, to January, February. What should have been happening was that the solar index should have been way, way up, close to uh, 180, 200, whatever. It wasn't, it started to go back down again. Right. So there was this kind of glitch, I suppose we call it, um, and it went down to 140. And then last week, right, all of a sudden, a huge increase went up to, uh, I think last time it was 183. 198 today. Sorry? 198. Okay, all right. So even, even more to the point that it seems to be going up. Um, oddly enough, and again, I don't know the reasons why, I'm not an expert on this, but <clears throat> when it was going down, right? Like, I mean, it was still in, in relation to where it was, say, a couple of years ago, it was like chalk and cheese. But, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I was still getting great QSOs, both voice and digital, on 10 meters. Um, not only that, but it stretched up to six meters as well. Um, six meters, uh, um, not a lot, but it came alive for uh, about four or five days sporadically. Um, I've actually been messing with the slow scan TV on six meters um, and actually had two QSOs, um, or kind of QSOs, literally, you know, I sent a frame, they sent a frame back. Um, so that, that, that was very rare. I mean, when I first uh, got my uh, the ASIN that I'm using for HF and six meters, um, I thought there was something wrong with it because I was sitting there, you know, chilling through six meters daily and hearing literally nothing. So much so that I changed the antenna, right? Messed around, you know, all the, the stuff that you'd normally do. And I was still getting nothing. And then to my immense surprise, I just I got on casually called CQ. And uh, back comes this guy in Phoenix who is so clear that he could be in the next room. Uh, so much so that I actually didn't believe that he was in Phoenix. And I, and I had a few other people come in front of me and thought, no, nah, everything. So uh, I'm literally sitting there asking questions about Phoenix, which I know a little bit about. Um, and sure enough, there he was, he was Phoenix. So I got a, an EQSL card from him uh, I think the following day and all that. Um, and but what, what, that was a couple of months ago. But what's happening now is to actually get a clean SSTV signal. Because I remember that for those of you who are not familiar with slow scan TV, that what you're looking at is duty cycles. This is what you've got to be really careful of. Same happens with Amazon TV as well. Um, now, for an average 340 by 280 pixel frame, which is kind of one of the standards of this, you would be transmitting for, well, depending on what system you use, you're probably going to run the transmitter for about a minute and a half, maybe two minutes, something like that. Now, I have to be very careful. I'm doing this on VHF. I've got an icon 9700 that I use for two minutes. Um, and I've tried SSTV on a couple of occasions, and I have to turn the power down to around about 10 watts, about 10%. Because anything over that, right, it will, it will actually overheat the, the uh, transmitter, which is not good. I'll be watching the little temperature gauge go up and up and up, and I've just been like, you know, turning it down and down, which is kind of a shame, right? Because, I mean, what you need to make it work will perhaps be to put a linear on the end of it. Uh, nonetheless, um, the QSI, the SSTV QSI had it, was with Arizona. Um, so it was approximately, I think it's about 1,100 miles, something like that. Um, and with SSTV, if you get interference or breaks, obviously the picture will break up. Uh, those of you who remember the days of VHS, for example, when you used to get a trapping error, right? You had that sort of distortion that went up and down the screen. It's kind of like, it looks a little bit like that. Um, the other thing I wanted to just share with you guys is you may remember that I Bought you some tears a few months ago on amateur TV 
Uh, this is analog amateur TV. Um, and since then, I've now managed to get two uh, transceivers. These are um, 440 meg, 70 centimeter transceivers. I only had the one before. Of course, you know, it's like we were talking over breakfast this morning. You know, the first time you got email, first time I got it was sort of in the early 90s. And so you get email, and you think, well, who the hell am I going to email? You know, I didn't know anyone else who actually had email. So it was like all dressed up and nowhere to go. And so I found a friend of mine had it. And it's the same thing with Amazon TV, um, that especially with analog Amazon TV. There used to be a big group of Houston that did it. They still have a website, but unfortunately nobody's active. And of course, the technology's moved on. It's now digital, right? But again, um, with uh, <clears throat> what I've been doing recently, um, I, what I did was to take one transmitter and uh, just fill up an antenna to the back of the car, right? Just drove around. Um, I managed to get something like about three miles away with five watts. But the interesting part was the three miles was downtown, right? So that's downtown with buildings all over the place, reflection, metal. There's a power station underneath 45, you know, stuff like that. Um, and I was still getting not the best picture in the world, but an acceptable picture. What I did was just to leave a test car up at home, left the transmitter running, right? With one exception, that I, I actually put a timer um, on the power to the transmitter because I was worried again about value of the heating. Because remember, you know, this duty, the duty cycles, with amateur TV, it's on all the time, right? Well, pretty much most of the time, unless you, you, you choose not to. Um, there is, for those of you who are interested in amateur TV, there is a, a, a weekly net which takes place. Um, and there's, um, uh, I can't remember, the, this YouTube channel, I'll put it up on the reflector. Um, they use YouTube as well and Zoom. Um, and it's weird because if you think about it, then you know you uh, most of these transceivers, whether they're analog or digital, are both uh, vision and audio. Um, so it's a question of actually working out what you're doing. Now, the next stage of this, just out of interest, if you are interested, is um, there is no ATV repeater in the Houston area. I think mean, the closest one I think is Dallas. There might be one up near Huntsville. I, I, I forget. Rough kid as well, and seems to have been there as well. So. Um, I'm, this is some, this is a, kind of a bucket list thing for me this year, is to see what it's going to cost and the effort required, and whether it's technically possible for me to actually build a, or, or get a repeater up, right? So if I can get an ATV repeater, then what I'm going to be looking for next is somebody that I can loan one of these transceivers to, so that we can actually do a proper QSO. So, um, again, the technology is it's, it's old technology. This is pre-flat screen TV. This is you know, when we have 26 inch cathode ray tubes and all that. But having said that, what I've done is to build a hybrid, right? So it, it's almost like reversing the technology. So we, what we've got is a, 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 an HD camera, a small HD camera. So that's, that's throwing out well, 1080 or whatever it happens to be. And that's going into what in fact is an old analog transmitter, and the quality is still maintained, which I'm quite surprised at. Um, you can, the transceiver allows you on the monitor to switch from like a local monitor, so you're hardwired to your camera, to the, the, trans, the signal as it's actually being transmitted. And I didn't believe it when I first saw it. I thought, oh, you know, the, the two were actually almost indistinguishable. Um, then when I actually went out with my little portable thing in the car, started messing around with that. I realized that, that that picture was actually done. So, uh, I mean, again, you know, uh, unfortunately, there's a downside to this, but uh, one of my granddaughters, who's about 12 years old, knows how to run an Apple iPhone better than I ever will. Um, you know, said to me, well, what's the point of that, Grandpa? You know, what, you know, what, 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 you know, why bother with that? You know, I've got my phone here. I can, I can you know, uh, like, for example, last night, my wife's in Australia at the moment, and I'm sitting there with a WhatsApp, you know, having a, Video board. Look at what we're doing here. Um, to do this, just to remind everybody, to do this in, say what, about 1990, something like that, we would have half a room full of equipment. Think about it. You'd have a camera, well, actually a little bit earlier than that, in the 80s, you'd have a camera to, to edit this would cost you somewhere in the region of between three and 500 bucks an hour in a dedicated edit suite. There's still a couple of them left in Houston. Um, but, you know, that's how much the world has changed. My answer to my granddaughter, if it's of any interest to you, is, listen, sweetie, what you're holding in your hand is a transmitter and receiver. 
right? All, all, you know, the only thing is we're just using a different system, and that's it. And she sort of went, oh, whatever. So, yeah, there you are. So if you have, if your grandkids are going to question what you're doing, then that's the answer. Um, if you give me a second just to call it up, there's, there's this really interesting video, going back to the propagation thing, I'm sorry, I went off topic here. Um, it's a very interesting video on what they call grey uh, propagation, um, which is, if you like, you know, what, what happens as things are going up and down. So if you just give me a second, talk on yourselves, I'm going to... I'll give you a second. <laughs> <Well>, second. <laughs> Two seconds. Okay, yeah, uh, to thank Tim Martin for helping me put this presentation together. Oh, you did a marvelous job. I, you know, I had bits and pieces that need to pull it all together for the geo play. So thank you, Martin. Thank you. Martin, Martin, you're most welcome. Most welcome. And by the way, if anybody else has a presentation or something they would like to share with the club, especially if you're not okay with PowerPoint or any of these things, um, please reach out. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm most happy to uh, to help you guys, uh, you know, if they uh, get these things. <laughs> I mean, you know, look at, again, what Roger said. I mean, we, we, we call this a de-expedition, but it's kind of the de-expedition that never was. <laughs> but it's a great story, right? And it's related to high radio. So, you know, like, think about it, guys. Have you got some stories? Now, let's have them. All right, give me a second. Make sure I actually connect. They tried that one island they were going to try to get to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next. Yeah. And it kind of was frozen island. And so then they had to, you know, get, they got the people over onto the ice and everything and never got it to work. But it was just horrible yeah. weather. And just, Batteries keep breathing. Yeah, and it, was just, it was just an awful thing. And to get there, they had to sail boat 24 hours to get over to the spot. And then they unloaded the people and went up and had to set up their boat station. But, you know, I think they like the idea of a Caribbean island a lot. Better. There was a, uh, a an American uh, that I worked a couple of times down in the South Pacific last year. And he has a huge private yacht. Went down there, set up um, a station on the island and operated it from his boat remotely so that you could get credit, you know, from the island. Uh, but, you know, what people go through it is amazing. And the cost of these things is just horrendous. But, um, they can't be fun if they work. <laughs> Just seeing if we can get some sound going here. You can sit, guys. I'm sorry about this. One. Trying to get sound out of this thing, it's not really something that works. Let's try that. Lower right corner, Martin, maybe. Yes. We've had this issue before. Yeah. It's not a time the volume of the problem. It's not like people to use their air. The volume. I had it work well, I can't. Not actually coming through. You know, from tell the story. I've just been thinking the frame is dead. I think they're full. Small cameras. Yeah. Yeah. Is Mark still next to me? He's out in the hall. Stations. Oh, Yeah, and no question asked. And welcome to your short radio channel. Um, I can't stress out enough talk of the phenomenon that I don't think it's a touch screen, Martin. Amazing. And that can actually give you a lot of signals that you might. All right, well, I'm halfway there. Just give me a sec. Um, that should be full screen. That would be too easy. 
Mark, just do it on yours. Just do it on your screen. Yeah, we're going to try. Should replicate it on the big one. So you're coming across full screen online. That's there we go. There you go. Oh, well, they had to teach Martin uh, in, in, in America what hand signals not to do. I don't know. Certain ones are gay, some of them are friendlies. Help me make fun of the foreigner. You know, one way is a victory, that way it's up here, so, you know, as I'm victory at the end of turn. Yeah. <clears throat> We got your screen over here right now. Oh, you got it now? Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, no. It's cool. Oh. Yep. Full yeah. screen. Full screen. Screen is really a good channel. I can't stress out enough to talk about it now. And that can actually give you a lot of signals that you might not hear in usually. And it's green line communications. If you notice here, uh, so Stop the volume on the front. There, right on the grand lake. So that means any station transmitting around here are going to be stations that are going to be enhanced because that transition zone where the ionosphere is technically reorganizing itself. Uh, in my case, the sun is setting, so the layers are actually slowly reorganizing and going into one single layer for the night. Uh, but they're still there because the sun is still hitting the high atmosphere. Uh, and it doesn't happen in just, you know, a couple of minutes. That transition actually happens over maybe an hour, a good hour. Um, well, that enhances propagation of on almost any, any frequency. It's not just, you know, lower or upper frequencies. It's, it could be on any frequency you'll hear something unusual. That's why there's a lot of uh, of agent signals that come in when you're at this time. Because when you start changing around, you might notice that the signals that Trying to see if I can find anything. You know, I make some good propagation. Propagation is good today, actually. Now, an example right now, but uh, a lot of the frequencies that actually propagate from Asia to here will be good, especially in the next hour, as uh, Japan will be in the zone in part of China and all of that. So this is uh, a great, great time to, to do this. Also remember this grain line changes throughout the year. It's not always this shape. This is the shape for the winter solstice. We're going to be in officially in winter in the Northern hemisphere and two, three days from now. This is what it looks like. But when you're in the summer solstice, for example, in North America, this is reversed. The big lump of lights at the bottom here is at the top. And the bottom will have that little uh, curve here uh, because it changes. The day and night patterns change throughout the year in the northern and southern hemisphere because of you know the seasons. So that changes. If you look at it in spring, uh, like in September, um, uh, in September again, yeah, September and fall, but in March for spring, you'll see that it actually makes two vertical lines. So that changing pattern means there are times of the year you have better chances of getting specific signals from an area. A a a good amateur radio operator that wants to make some great contacts throughout the year. Will take advantage of that. Uh, an example that I have here is I've been making around, let's say, in half an hour to an hour from now, especially when Japan starts being really in the gray line, 
I've been making in terms of amateur contacts with Japanese stations that are uh, plenty at this time because of the gray line. But if you look in the summertime or in different times when that has changed, you'll notice that, for example, Japan is not favored anymore, but there's a, another country or other areas of the world that are favored for that. So it's very important to take a look at the gray line all the time. Uh, it changes shape slowly, but it changes shape. If you look now, if you look into, say you look at it at, on January 15th, and then on February 15th, you'll actually notice the shape shifting of the gray line and how things are different and how that gray line from your area to another part of the world has changed and now gives you maybe an advantage for some other countries or other continents. So uh, it is it is a very, very good time for radio listening also. So do check it out. Now, the gray line is an important part of the uh, communications on shortwave. And uh, they really, really enhance signals a lot. Um, I told you the live shows, for those that follow the live shows, that uh, an example of that is uh, LRA 36 in, Argent in, the, in Antarctic. Well, now is not the best time for me, but when the gray line will be a little straighter, so you know, maybe uh, by end of January, for example, in February, um, I will get back my listening to LRA 36 in a more decent level. So all of that shifts propagation. That's why there are signals that you'll hear for a month, two months, and then they disappear. They come back the next, you know, six months later because the shape comes back to the same shape. So typically the shape you see here um, will change, but there are periods like uh, spring and fall where that same shape comes back again twice. So you'll have it in spring and you'll have it in fall. So just like at the gray line, there are, uh, I'll share with you the, uh, one of the, the websites, which is time and date, which does have the, uh, the day night pattern live on a map in your browser. So you can check out, uh, you know, where's the gray line and where is it actually all around the world? If you enjoy my videos, please subscribe, give us thumbs up. Thank you for watching my videos. And thank you for coming. So, to give you an idea of, I mean, I don't know whether any of you actually use any of the, uh, the websites around, but this one is what I use. It's going to load. Give me one second. All right. This is where we are right now. So, for those of you who are not familiar with this website, it's German. Uh, this guy's pretty good, and there are others, by the way. But as you can see, I mean, red means basically red is good, right? And, you know, blue is not. So, where are we now? We're at an interesting point because had we done this three or four hours ago, we would have seen more of a red blotch here. Um, so, Europe would have been more, more uh, easily accessible. And that's not to say, by the way, that we were tuning now. I mean, one what, of what my. Uh, I'm just trying to look at the band that I'm on here. Just one second. This is for 10 meters. Okay, we could we could do it equally for um, for uh, other bands as well. But <laughs> the other thing is, if you remember the last meeting or at some point or other, I bored you all with the what we call the dome map. And this is this is a, a very good, uh, almost perfect representation of the dome map. Um, so you would think by looking at this that Houston down here. Right, it's in the blue, so we'd be like things will be lousy. Wrong, absolutely wrong. I mean, I, <clears throat> I turned on uh, my receiver before I came out this morning, about, about six thirty, something like that. And um, I mean, especially on the digital stuff, FT8, FT4, it was going gangbusters. I mean, I don't need modern transmitting, it's just, just absolutely bad. So, what's going to happen though when this moves forward and we can do a little simulation here? Is if we move forward to say this evening, look at what happens. And this is the interesting bit. The donut is alive and well here. 
but it's, it's not really going to affect us when we're transmitting from uh, from down here. And of course, what's happening now, as you can see, we go the uh, the balloon or whatever you want to call it is moving across. So that by the time we get to this evening, which would be UTC about one o'clock, <coughs> that's our brain eye. Yeah, and remember we, what uh, what our friend just said: two vertical lights. I mean, there it is, proof of it, right? <coughs> and all of a sudden, <coughs> South America has come alive. Those of you who've done have tried digital on ten meters or anything else will see there's a huge number of South American stations on. Um, my favourite to do so was with, was uh, with the Falkland Islands uh, Radio Society or Amateur Radio Society. They're down here. Uh, just a 200 miles, uh, 300 miles uh, east of Ushuaia, um, and Buenos Aires is, is just here. Um, and uh, it's, it's always nice to, uh, to to get something like that. Likewise, uh, there is a radio station that when, when I worked with the government years ago, um, there was an island about here called Ascension Island. Um, and uh, they, in fact, there's two islands. There's Ascension Island, and 200 miles south is the island of St. Helena, or St. Helena. St. Helena is famous because of Napoleon. That's where they finally ended up there. And as a result of Napoleon being put on St. Helena, just to go really off the topic, uh, the British invaded Ascension Island, which actually looks very much like Saba, except it's not as nice. It's kind of more grubby and volcanic. Um, and that was the airbase, by the way, that was used. It's actually a US Air Force base now, we stacked from the Royal Air Force. And that's where they ran what up until the B 52s from Barksdale um, did was the longest ever bombing run uh, during a wartime situation. Um, they flew from Ascension Island down refueling 11 times down to uh, the Falklands, bombed the runway. It was basically it's 1982 when we were trying to basically put the willies up the Argentinians and stop them using Port Stanley airfield. Um, and then they were refueled back. Just to, if it's of any interest whatsoever, there is a lovely story. There were six of these missions. They were called Black Buck. Um, and the last one, because um, they were old aircraft, this was the, like the nuclear bomber force, so it was old as B-52s. Um, the refueling nozzle broke off on the way back. They had to land at Rio de Janeiro, um, and then, if I mean, somebody's got to make a movie about this because it was comedy of errors, right? Um, and they had attached the bottom of the aircraft something they shouldn't have had, which was a strike, a US strike missile, which President Reagan had very kindly donated on the QT to Margaret Thatcher. Um, <laughs> and they had two of them. They managed to get rid of one of them over the uh, Atlantic, but the other one didn't come off. So they landed at Rio, were uh, held for a couple of days, and then uh, the uh, Brazilian government gave uh, the Vulcan, that was the aircraft, back to uh, let the crew go and all the rest of it. Uh, but the missile um, kind of went AWOL, went completely missing. Um, and, uh, and so somewhere in, in Brazil, they now have a, or they did have a strike missile. Back to propagation. So what you can expect to see this evening, maybe what, six, seven o'clock, would be exactly what our friend in the video did just now. We will see the balloon, this red piece come over here. Japan comes alive. I mean, those of you who have been around early, many will come alive. But in addition to that, uh, we're now getting to the point where the balloon, it tends to fade when you get to kind of in, uh, to Burma, Myanmar, around here or Vietnam. But as the prediction is for the next couple of months, we're just going to move a little bit this way. So what I'm hoping for are contacts in or QSOs in India, Pakistan, and possibly, I don't know whether they have any hands left in Iran, but maybe uh, there, and also within the Arabian Peninsula. So that's really the next bit. The other good thing are quite a number of hands in West Africa, uh, especially down here to Porta and Goba. Um, and uh, I had a couple of QSOs with them. I had one voice QSO with a Sierra Leone. Uh, that's up here, uh, Sierra Leone um, uh, town. Um, his, his English was almost unintelligible, and so, the, so it was one of those sort of semi comedic QSOs, but that's to give you an idea. Sites like this, I would strongly recommend because although we know by turning on the radio that, you know, who's there and who's not, it's always good to have some kind of a reference. Okay. 
All right. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mark in a minute when he comes back, because uh, I think he's got a few things he wants to go through. But before he does, I just want to do a little bit of you know, a buying and selling bit. So does anybody have any equipment that they wish to dispose of? Or wish to or equipment that they're looking for? I know with Matt, he was looking for uh, some connectors. Um, and we were kind of working on that for some old World War II stuff. So if anyone, has anyone done any stuff that they're selling or they want? Or donating or anything like that. No, no taking. It's okay. Well, in connection with that, that little green box back there, sitting on the table, is what we have left from Panfest, and it is there for general use. It's just got bits and pieces. But um, please help yourselves to, to what's in that box if there's anything of any interest. <clears throat> All right. At the uh, at the Hamfest, they launched the balloon. On Friday, we were there Saturday, and it had already gone. It was already near the middle of the Atlantic at seventy-one thousand feet. And I don't, I don't, never heard of any update from that one. However, but later on, they're kind of hoping we can circle, circle the navigate the world. You know, just a lot. Oh yeah, we didn't. They, they didn't get any updates. Anthony, do you know anything about updates on the balloon? Quite, uh, quite a few. Uh, a couple of days ago, Dwayne and I at work were talking about one of them made it all the way around. Almost in the same location where it launched. Wow. wow. So it was like kind of coincidence that it made it all the way around almost exactly where it took off at. <laughs> um, if y'all have to keep our reflective, or if you can get a hold of one phone, it sends out an email every once in a while and gives you the heads up of where that balloon is done, where that boat was going. And we get a lot of them. That's what we had the Gaggle guys come in. For testing, everybody passed. You crash and burns on there. No, they're practicing. Um, so you have 20 bucks on it. That's your, your dues, Roger. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we do. over to you, Mark. Okay. So Roger. Roger is. Yeah. Roger Matisse, right? Yes. Okay. So you've got 20 days. Okay. So this is the summary of the uh, active membership and the bank account. So we have, including Roger, which I conveniently left on the active role, we have 32 paid members as of today. So uh, that there's a couple of checks that have not been deposited. So we will get those into the, into the bank and then the rest is cash. Our balance with everything except for Roger's is three thousand seven hundred sixty dollars and thirty eight cents. That's the current amount of uh, money that we have collected and in the bank. And then, uh, so does that I include will, the donation from the sale? It doesn't include the donation from the sale, and that which how much was how three three fifty one? I think three it was about three fifty something like that. One stone. All right, now that will that's still this that was that envelope I gave you earlier. Yeah. So those are all those will go all in the bank um on Monday. Well as soon as I can um get to the uh uh Wells Fargo. So as far as so that membership is that's the paid membership. Most of those came from uh last month or the prior prior month. We have what I would call 15 members that are in what I call inactive and actually it will we'll, we'll add one because Christy is going to uh, sell me uh, her, her fee but uh, those include the guys that did not that, that were just sort of missing in action or have not been paid in over a year okay, right? just haven't shown up haven't been on the net anything like that so there's usually a few guys. Some of these guys I see that are on the net, they just haven't paid. So that includes guys, you know, uh, some of the guys that show up on the net that like, you know, don't participate are not are not paid, which is fine. And then we have what I call the missing in action, which are guys that are over two years not paid. Some of these have moved on. Some guys just going to show up. So we have thirty three. Uh, people that have been, you know, members of the club within the last two years, or past two years, just are not active. So, um, but everybody is on all. Everyone on the on this list is on email blast that goes out with the 
club meeting and the young people tent. So what I'll do is um, for all the guys that are in that I li that list as inactive or missing in action, I will send them a note directly about the dues and see what uh, see what comes up. So sometimes they respond, sometimes they don't. And uh, that's, that's about it. As far as expenses go, um, the only expenses we had we had uh, were the, earlier in the year were forty bucks for a Houston Amateur Mobile Society, which that was in January, and then coming up will be the club insurance, which will be like two hundred and some odd dollars. Other than that, we don't have any other direct expenses. There are some reimbursable expenses, I think, for Jeremy, which we were going to. We'll settle up. up for coffee and stuff like that, and then we'll cover his dues. And then um, I don't really think there's any any other reimbursable expenses. We've got the where's Rusty? See, did he? I think he left. booked out. Okay, so the we we he had a pretty good backlog of expenses for the website domain and all of it. So the, the, everything is paid up. And he, he, his backlog is paid. So if there's any other club expenses that I wasn't aware of, did, did we pay the did we pay the table? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You got this. So everything this is down in the envelope. Okay. So that so everything's true. Done. That's all set. Okay. Right. Seven. That's seven. all set. Okay. So that's it. So what I will do is um, I typically don't post the addresses and all the details on the website just for security. But what I'll do is send out a list of the who's listed as an active member, you know, the kind of the summary. Because and then I have traditionally taken your roster and then our style to do probation. Okay. Okay. And I'll said you go to the members link on our webpage, you'll see what I typically post. Okay. But I extract that from your from the free atlas. Post. Okay. I'll I will um there's something personal out there. No, no, okay, that's fine. Yeah, I forgot what we did. You know, let a year ago, I can't remember, can't remember stuff happened last week. So um, I'll get it with you and then I'll send that to the full roster to you so you can tell me to take a look. But if you, you know, you, we need to contact somebody directly, we can, and anybody can get that through Barry or myself or um, Mark. Uh, any questions? I have a um, One soul. Wenzel, I think you are. Uh, I don't think you. Are we okay? Yeah, I'll check. Uh, here, All right. let me check it. Let me check it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Take, uh, take that as well. What, from uh, what? That's, that's from Project Me. I, you're. Oh, okay. No. You put it up. You put something in the back. Yeah. Okay. So here's Rogers, and then your your pay. Yeah. No, your. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. That's good. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, with, with respect to security, I know we're trying to protect people's uh, thing, but if you want to contact the club member other than using their call sign to go to QRZ and maybe get an email, is there no way we'll ever be able to access phone numbers or anything like that? Or I can we can send them out as a PDF or something, but I don't want to have it on the website. On the yeah, right. I mean, if you need the club, if people want the club roster, somebody send me. You can email. supply that. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, but I don't want to just have it out on the website. Honors we don't have sure. it. You know, it's not well secured there. Um, so, I think that's it. Anything else? We got one, one more thing to go. One more thing. Pass or test. Everybody pass or test. How many?